Are you usually so open? Yep. So Why? Yeah. I think because I'm 78 years old, and by the time you get to be this age, you're just totally open. Why not? Can you talk about what your style says about you? It says that I am forthright, open, that I am conceited because I'm willing to wear whatever I want. I don't care what anybody else thinks about it. When I was young, I thought I was ugly. My grandmother... You thought you were ugly? Yeah. I looked exactly like my dad, who I thought was very good looking, like my grandmother, who I thought was very ugly. And when people would say to my grandmother, oh, your grandbaby looks just like you, she'd say, I was never that ugly in my life. My nose was too big. My mother had a thing of always going like this to do her nose, and she taught me to do it too. That doesn't make any difference. Your nose is going to be what it's going to be. But you know, she was quite convinced that she was ugly because her nose spread all across her face. And I thought I was ugly because my nose stuck out. I was pretty much a tomboy from the time my mother married my second stepfather. Um, until I left college and went to the Air Force. I sang music in the Air Force and got to tour military bases all around the country. Can you talk about um, the assumptions that you think people might make about you based on your style? Um, they're probably right, whatever assumptions they make. <laughs> that I'm outrageous, that I am outspoken, that I am a very radical person, because I'm always talking about politics as Bernie Buttons, and I voted for Jill rather than vote for either the dump or um, uh, Clinton. And I was uh, up in the air as to whether or not to vote for Clinton or Obama. And I have to admit that I went for the color. The idea that we could possibly have a black president was more important to me than having a woman one, a white woman one. So people think that you're radical, that you're outrageous. Is there anything that you think they assume that might not be true? Well, I've had the same husband for 58 years. That's, I don't know, that's kind of reached the point of being outrageous too. Huh? The first time I saw David and noticed him, we girls were all sitting around the table in the um, Airmen's Club. He had a crew cut, blonde, and he was wearing green and yellow plaid Bermuda shorts and a red and blue plaid shirt and he was smoking a corn cob pipe. We'd stay in the women's barracks, and the guys stayed in the guys' barracks, and if we were at a party, they would like, you know, see us home. So he walked us home. I was saying good night, and he grabbed me and kissed me. <laughs> and kissed me, and kissed me. <laughs> and so after that, we were pretty much a couple. He asked the, our commanding officer if he could borrow the car and we could go for a ride. And the four barbershop quartet who had beat us out at command and who were also on the tour objected to the fact that he had loaned the car to a mixed couple. The officer's reply to that was to give us the keys and walk out of the room. I was so thrilled with him for being non-racist, you know what I mean? He was the officer in charge and he could have been but he wasn't. He was. was this your first experience w f with falling in love with someone that wasn't of color? Actually, yes it was, but it was not my first time getting in trouble with somebody that was not of color. There was this white guy in college who invited me to, to go to the movies. We were seen standing in line at the movies and it was reported to campus. I was asked not to come back to the school the next year, which I thought was really stupid because all of the black football, basketball players were dating white girls. And they, none of them were gonna be kicked out of school because their team would lose. And then in basic training, I had a white friend and we went into town together. We went to this restaurant to eat. The guy comes over and he says to her, I can serve you, but I can't serve her. And she says, well, Rosalind, I'll see you back at the base. And I said, nothing, and I just got up and walked out. And as I was walking out, I was thinking to myself, you might see me, but I won't see you. So how did it feel with, with, with the time that, when you first got together with your husband? He had to smuggle me off and on the base so that it, it didn't look like I was in his car. I would hide under the uh, blankets on the floor in the back seat. You, so you couldn't be public together? Yeah, we were public together, but we were public together in black places where white folks would co could come. We couldn't go to primary white clubs, period. I couldn't. We were in Texas. Think about that. Texas in 1959? No. Uh-uh. 
I couldn't eat in the restaurants. I couldn't go to the clubs. Yeah, I could go to the stores and spend my money. Could you guys like walk down the street together? I don't think we did. After we got married in Michigan, we didn't meet again until I got out of the Air Force because I was pregnant. And he had gone, gotten accepted in Berkeley. Word. We were walking down the street in Berkeley, holding hands, and a little old white lady, about this high, was walking to us and she spit at us and said, you're disgusting. And we looked at her and we looked at each other and we cracked up. It was funny. Some lady's going to spit at us because we're walking down the street holding hands. But I had already gone through trying to find an apartment. So I was looking for two bedrooms because I was pregnant. And I opened the paper and I got out my notebook and I wrote down address and phone numbers of all the places that had prices I could afford. And I called them all and made appointments. They, apartments were not available, none of them. They had just been rented. So I went home and I gave David my list and I said, here, call these people, make an appointment and go see them. Every single apartment was still available. I never felt like I was a second class citizen, but sometimes I felt like I was being um, treated unfairly, that there's prejudice against me that there shouldn't have been. I never felt as though I deserved it, no. Um, but you know, you internalize it even so. That's the, the worst thing about prejudice is internalizing it, feeling that it's not them, it's you, that somehow or another you don't qualify. Where do you get your strength? From my mother, my grandmother's and David, because he tells me I'm beautiful every day. <laughs> and he tells me he loves me, and he does. And I never really felt like I was pretty. And David telling me I was beautiful was, what's wrong with your eyes? He goes, but you are, honey, you're beautiful. Really? And I kept waiting for him to decide that I wasn't, but he never has. Can you talk about what has been your biggest struggle? I think last year we made $15,000 for the year together. And I think that part of that, of course, is because um, we're musicians. We are probably down in um, poverty level. I think poverty level now is $17,000 per person. And we're only making 15 for the two of us. We live in the Bywater, and it's gone from being a mostly black, um, mostly poor neighborhood to being mostly white, mostly upper middle class. Um, a multimillionaire built his house in what we used to call our backyard. All of a sudden, my rent has gone in one month from $800 to 16. We had to borrow money from our kids. When do you feel the most vulnerable? So we were in Jackson Square, and um, this woman was upset because I was supporting Bernie, and she was supporting Hillary. And she ran over and grabbed my hat and pull it off, and some of my hair came out. It's still out, it's growing back. But she, she pulled my braids literally off my head. I went berserk. I, I went after her, I, gra I, gra I grabbed her, I threw her down to the ground, and two, she's white, two other white women came up and grabbed me, and I was getting ready to sock them, and I realized, Rosalind, if you hit anybody else, you're going to jail. Those two girls and that one on the ground will all be three people testifying against you. When people are challenging me for doing something that is legal and right and that I have a right to do, that, that makes me feel vulnerable. And it's not always that I can do anything about it. I mean, cops have come up and taken, uh, took, taken my amplifier. They sent out seven police officers, including a police woman, to take the amplifier. We were sitting playing on Jackson Square again. And, you know, like, but other things like that, where, where police have, have, you know, police have bothered me, I, it's a vulnerability because you can't really fight back. Um, Why? Although sometimes- Why can't you fight back? 
Because they're cops. You hit them and you're dead. Especially if you're a black woman. Actually, they have killed black women for no reason at all. You've had a lot to deal with, and yet you still smile and laugh a lot yeah. and, and love life. Oh, yeah. How do you, how do, you do that? There's so many beautiful things in the world. What can you say? Life is good. Life is to be valued. Life is important. I've made a lot of changes and, and made other people happy. I've done a lot of things that were good. I've had a lot of fun. Lord, have I had a lot of fun. woo -hoo! And I've made people happy. I've made my husband happy. Um, my children all love me. I've just been very, very blessed, I think. I think that God loves me, and I love her. <laughs> and I suspect that she's a black woman with a good sense of humor. <laughs> I wear my purple panties instead of red ones. Do, 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 do. So, here's Rosalind. <laughs>